Thank you. Thank you, Kyler. Um, very excited to be here. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us today. And uh, today we're going to be talking for around 45 to 50 minutes. And then we're going to leave a couple of minutes at the end of the webinar to go over Q&A. So uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions, uh, you can just click on the Q&A button uh, on, on, the, um, on your toolbar. And I uh, will try my best to answer all the questions at the end. So today we're going to be talking about a, uh, about a very, very interesting topic. And, and the title of the lecture is, When Do We Stop Giving Teeth a Chance? And um, it is a very uh, interesting topic because uh, here in the office, we have this discussion almost every day, right? When do you decide if you want to keep a tooth or you want to remove it and place an implant. So we're going to go over um, the different algorithms that we use here in our office and the different thought process that we have to uh, use when we analyze these cases. So first of all, uh, I always like to start with this slide. Uh, I did my uh, dental school in Mexico City. Uh, then I did my uh, prosthodontic residency and an MS in neurofacial pain at the uh, USC, University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And then I did a year of um, implant fellowship. It was a surgical training at the University of Louisville. Uh, after uh, finalizing my um, training, I had the opportunity uh, to go back home to Mexico City, which is where I'm from originally, and join uh, Dr. Ricardo Mitrani in practice, which I'm sure uh, most of you know, he's a resident faculty at Spirit Education and uh, amazing clinician and uh, amazing le uh, lecturer as well. So uh, we've been working together for the past uh, eight years now, and we have a great uh, team that works together here with us in the office. So uh, during the webinar today, I'm going to try to avoid using the word I and uh, use the word we, because um, the work that uh, we're going to be showing today, it's uh, hard work and uh, many, many people and many hands involved in the process of all the um, philosophy and thought process that we're going to share with you today, but also all the clinical work. So I'm very, very excited um, for you to be joining uh, the webinar. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, have heard the name Spear. Uh, for those of you who are not very familiar, Spear Education is uh, the premier center uh, for education in the world. Uh, it's located in Scottsdale, Arizona, and has amazing uh, facilities, both for seminars and workshops. And there's also a lot of um, content that um, uh, Spear does online so that you can watch it uh, wherever you are. Um, so we're going to go over a um, couple of... Um, topics today and uh, we're going to be sharing a lot of articles and a lot of information so if you have any questions at all or you want to reach out to me ask me uh, for a specific article for me to send something any questions about a case you can um, do it through Instagram which is a channel that we use uh, quite often here's my uh, information and you can also use uh, my email address um, to send me any information or to ask for anything in particular. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and start our webinar today. And as you can see here, we have a, a maxillary uh, reconstruction. It's a zirconia uh, framework with layered ceramics on implants. And one of the questions that we get asked the most uh, by our patients, and I'm sure you get everyone in the world gets these questions a lot, it's will those implants last forever, right? I'm sure you've had this asked before. So doctor, I'm going to be investing all this money and all this time in reconstruction, either in implants or in teeth. Will this last forever? And the answer is, of course, no. Nothing that we do will last forever. Uh, we have amazing technology and we use quite a bit of CAD CAM technology nowadays that allows us to use better materials with more predictability but whatever we do, even though it looks very nice and we're going to be able to more or less mimic what we have in nature, potentially can break, right? So what happens? All of our patients come to our office with a set of expectations, right? 
when you go to a restaurant, you always have certain expectations, whether the food is going to be good, whether the ambience is going to be good, and it's going to be based on whatever previous experiences you've had in that place or recommendations from friends or family. So if you have high expectations and the reality of what you end up getting is lower than your expectations, that's going to lead to frustration and disappointment. And that's exactly the same thing that happens with our patients. They have an expectation to get some type of treatment. And nowadays, these expectations are regarding treatment time. As we know, everyone wants to have everything done quickly. This concept of immediate gratification in which we want to have everything done instantly, right? I mean, I am a millennial and nowadays as millennials and also baby boomers and all the other um, classifications, if you will, are used to ordering stuff on Amazon and getting it the same day. So this translates to our office and we have patients coming in saying, I want to get this done today. So you have to go through the process of explaining the biological time and how long, for example, does it take for an implant to osteointegrate before we can move into a final restoration? Everyone is, expects also for the performance and the longevity of these restorations to last forever. And as I said before, that's not a reality. So this is something that we have to have very, very clear in our communication with our patients. And of course, the aesthetics and the function which should be ideal, right? In our mind as dentists, we understand that there are limitations, both aesthetically and functionally, when we start losing our teeth. But we need to be able to communicate that to our patient so that way they can understand better. Now, as we know, we work in a very, very hostile environment. The mouth has over 700 different types of bacteria, uh, uh, viruses, fungi, we go through this thermocycling process in which we have cold, hot, cold, hot, and we know that this will make the materials both expand and contract. And we use the mouth to speak, but also to grind on the teeth, right? When we're grinding on food or we have some type of parafunctional activity that will impact and have different types of wear on our materials. So this is something very, very important that we have to communicate to our patients so they can understand better why things can fail. And it's not a matter of if things will fail. We know it's going to fail. Just the question is, how is it going to fail? And when is it going to fail? And whenever it fails, what is the plan that, that we have in place in order for us to fix that problem? So we're going to go over this question of when do we want to save teeth, right? When do we stop giving hope on teeth and we decide to extract them? And when do we want to keep those teeth and use them as supports for our reconstruction? And we're going to show different clinical examples of both scenarios. But most importantly, our aim for today is not to show nice cases, is to really go deep into our thought process and explain the different options that we have for each case but most importantly, why did we choose that option and show you pictures of the finalized result? I love this concept that uh, my partner, Dr. Uh, Mitrani, uh, taught me many years ago about the fine line between being negligent and over-treating a patient. So whenever you have a patient that comes in and you have, let's say you have a crown on a tooth that comes off. And when it comes up, you can see that there's a reconstruction on that uh, tooth with some decay. You don't have very good ferrule and you have a root canal uh, on that tooth and some uh, periapical lesion. Now, you can go both ways in cases like this. You can go through the heroic process of redoing the root canal and replacing a post with a, with a core and then making a new crown, probably some crown lengthening and try to save the tooth. And that would be a great option. Or you can decide to remove the tooth and place an implant. And in a lot of cases, both options are right. So it ends up being a choice that the patient needs to make together with us as a team. But this fine line of being negligent or being preventive and over treating our patients it's something that we have to struggle with every day. And I'm sure that if we 
struggle with it. Everyone that's uh, participating in this webinar, I'm sure you are too as well, wherever you are. So yeah, I really recommend you to think about this concept of being negligent or over-treating the patient and every day walking in that fine line. For example, this patient came to see us with a bridge, a fixed partial denture that got decemented on those abutment teeth. And this is a typical call that you get to your office and say, doc, I had my bridge come off. I just want to come very quickly, 10, 15 minutes, and I want to have it uh, cemented back in place, right? Seems very easy. Your assistant tells you there's a patient coming in for an emergency treatment. They just want to have something uh, re-cemented, right? When we see the patient, things change, right? Uh, really, uh, it's that easy to re-cement a bridge on those teeth. And even if you want to do it, there's no predictability on that treatment. And we know that's gonna, not going to work because there's a lot of uh, decay around those teeth. There's no feral. Uh, we have uh, no structural um, area that we can bond the bridge back to. So ends up being a discussion with a patient that they don't have the idea that they have a problem, right? They come in with a specific um, instruction of having something re-cemented. And then when you start going through the process of explaining, uh, Ms. Jones, this is not going to be as easy as you thought. We have a big problem here. Let me explain what's going to happen. Then that's a tricky part of a conversation. But the most important part uh, for the purposes of today's lecture is going through the thought process of what are the factors that we should consider when we're asking ourselves these questions of if whether we wanna keep or remove teeth. So first of all, we have to go through the assessment of the remaining teeth. And then we have to take into consideration the patient's chief complaint, the expectation, and the finance. So those are the main factors that we're gonna analyze through in every case that we're gonna be showing today. Now, when we analyze the remaining teeth, we have to analyze in both or in two areas. Number one is structural. That means how much tooth structure do I have left for me to work with? And number two would be the biological part of the, of the tooth. And that would be any periodontal problems or any endodontic problems. So again, structural and biological. So we like to use this uh, classification. There's a lot of classifications in the perio uh, literature, but this is just a uh, checklist for things you have to look through when you analyze a uh, tooth or the assessment of the remaining dentition, right? So percentage of bone loss, probing depth, distribution and type of bone loss, what is the presence and the severity of furication uh, problems if we have, if there's any mobility, what's the crown to root ratio, what is the root form, if we have any pulpal involvement, if we have post and core, if we have decay or caries, what is the structural integrity of that tooth, if we have a feral effect, what is the position, what is the occlusal relationship, and very importantly, what is the strategic value when we're dealing with these full arches. And we're gonna go through all of these one by one in the cases, uh, but it's good to have always a checklist so you can always go back and see, am I looking at all the things that I have to look at? Perfect. Now we move on to what's called the treatment planning algorithm. So we're going to share with all of you what we use in our office every day. Uh, we have a very busy practice here in Mexico City where we do all the way from preventive dentistry, that means uh, cleanings, uh, uh, remineralization, uh, composite all the way through very big reconstructions and implants and grafting and full arch and implants. So we go through the whole uh, scenario of patients that we can see in our office. And today we're going to be sharing this very complex question of whether we want to keep or remain, uh, want to keep or extract remaining teeth. So the assessment of the remaining teeth should be both quantitative and qualitative from a number standpoint, one very important question that we need to ask ourselves is how many teeth do I have remaining in an arch? And from the condition, we will look into this amazing concept that was introduced by Frank Spear many years ago, which is called the EFSB, 
which means aesthetics, function, structure, and biology. And for all, those of you who don't know what these concepts are, I will really recommend you to dive into Spirit Education platform and go over the articles and videos. Or they have a lot of online courses by amazing, amazing um, clinicians. They have great uh, resident faculty, Dr. Frank Spear, Greg Kinzer, Ricardo Mitrani, Jeff Rouse, uh, Darren Deister. They have amazing clinicians that really go into detail when educating and teaching all these concepts. So. Again, condition, EFSB, which is the acronym, distribution, and the strategic value. So the distribution is going to play a very, very important role in making this decision because it's not going to be the same for us if we have, let's say, four teeth, and that's going to be from lateral to lateral in the maxilla, or we're going to have the four teeth distributed all around the arch. And that's going to play a very, very important role in making the decision if we want to keep or, re or, or remove. So remember the number of teeth, but most importantly, the distribution. As you see here, right? We have four teeth that are all lined up one next to another on, on the left side, but on the right side of the screen, we have four teeth that are not right next to each other. So the, we, we like to call this the unfavorable or favorable distribution because there's no white and black. There's no right or wrong. Uh, you can make always a decision that you feel more comfortable in your hands and also with your patient, but we just want to give you all these guidelines for you to think about when making the decision. So from a distribution standpoint, we're going to look at location, whether it's anterior teeth or posterior teeth and the symmetry. That means if we have unilateral distribution or bilateral distribution. Next, we have to look at the what's called the dentogingival aesthetics. It is very, very important for us to start looking into lips, smiles, and the whole face of the patient. There's an amaz amazing workshop at Spirit Education that's called FGTP, which means functionally uh, facially generated treatment planning. Again, FGTP, facially generated treatment planning. And it's amazing to they work so that they go over how we should analyze a patient's uh, smile and face. So very important, take a look at the patient and we have to see whether the lips, when the patient is smiling, the upper lip is gonna travel all the way high and the patient is gonna expose some type of pink or gingiva or when the patient smile, it's going to be only white, what we're going to be seeing, right? So as you can see here from this animation, when we remove the teeth, we'll analyze the position of the lip. So we're going to look again at two things for, from a dental gingival aesthetic standpoint. We will look at the gingival harmony. That means if we have all the gingival levels at the same plane, or we have different levels from a gingival uh, point of view. And as I said, the lip mobility, we have to see if the lip travels very high up and the patient is gonna expose uh, some type of uh, gingiva when they're smiling. So as a summary, we'll look at the number, the distribution and the position of the lip. And that's gonna give us what we like to call the aesthetic risk. And we, you can have a high aesthetic risk if the patient is showing some type of pink or you can have a low aesthetic risk if the patient is only showing white. We know that when we're doing a reconstruction, either on teeth or implants or combined, if the patient is showing that interface between the pink and the white, it's gonna be a more challenging case. So let's go over this amazing algorithm of the teeth assessment. And we have this grid here and I'm gonna go over the different parts of the grid. So bear with me and I'm sure you will understand. It's very easy. And again, if you want to have a, um, a copy of the article, you can find it at the Spirit Digest or you can just send me a message and then we'll be happy to send it your way. So first thing on the left, we'll look at, as I said, the structural integrity. So structural damage. And we have this as yes and the solution would be extract. So if you have severe structural damage, even if the perio and the endo part looks good, if you have severe structural damage, the indication would be to extract. Now, when we look at the other side of the grid, 
that the periodontal damage. If we have a lot of periodontal damage, then the answer would be yes, that means we have to extract. But now we, we go into the gray area, right? So we talked about the number of teeth, we talked about the distribution of those teeth, and we talked about the dental gingival aesthetics. So once we have those three, we're gonna put them in the mix and that's going to guide us whether we wanna maintain or extract. So if you see on those lower corners, on the right and the left corners, we have extract and in the middle we have maintain. So let's say we don't have periodontal damage and we don't have structural damage. So we look again into distribution and the dental gingival aesthetics. So if the dental gingival aesthetics is inadequate or the distribution is unfavorable, that's gonna lead to extraction. If the dental gingival aesthetics and the distribution is favorable, that will lead to maintain. So if you can see here in this area, let's say the distribution is favorable, that leads to maintain the tooth. If let's say we don't have periodontal damage, we have an adequate dental gingival aesthetics that will lead to maintain the tooth. And in the center, we have to always remember that we'll have to go through that assessment of what we call the EFSB, which is a aesthetics, structural, and biology. So if you can see, uh, this looks to be a very busy slide. It seems to be a very busy slide, but once you go through it, it's very, very easy to ask yourself a question, structural damage. If we have a lot of structural damage, then extract. So this is a grid that helps us make an objective decision because most of the decisions that we make in our office, and I'm sure, and I'm talking as dentists, not as us in our clinical office, is based on feelings, right? Based on bias and based on previous experiences. So we always have that uh, feeling of saying, oh, I think that tooth needs to come out. But when we ask ourselves like objectively, what are the parameters that we're going through when making that decision? Sometimes it's difficult to make that analysis. So that's why we always like to work with algorithms with objective parameters so we can replicate our thought process for many patients. So I hope that uh, was not very confusing. Uh, as I said, uh, we can always send you this information so you can go over it in detail. I don't have a lot of time. It's only one hour today. So we're going to be going through all the uh, process, all the thought processes and all the algorithms um, very uh, quickly. Now, let's go into our first case of uh, today. So this patient uh, comes to see us and... Um, one of the first things that we have to do, as I uh, explained before, is the lip mobility assessment, right? We said that the lip is very important for us to analyze, and we have to see if when the patient is smiling, it goes all the way uh, very high up. Now, we used to do this with pictures before, but we know that it's very difficult for us to come in, you know, with a big camera and the soft boxes and all these like very sophisticated equipment and tell the patient like, have, give us a big smile. Then the patient, you know, smile like this, like that. We don't have a real genuine smile. So we've seen that with the video, it's much easier and you don't have to buy any sophisticated equipment just with your iPhone, just uh, do a quick video of the patient as you can see here. And then you can freeze the image where the patient is laughing and you can just put it in the presentation. And as you can see here, we can see that our patient has a very um, notable asymmetry of the lip. And on her left side, we can see that the lip travels very high up and we can see that junction there. Now, um, we go into intraoral pictures and intraoral analysis. This was a patient that was a single mom uh, and, you know, it's one of those patients that tells you, oh, I've been taking care of my kids for many years, but now they're OK. And now it's my turn to take care of myself. Uh, but as you can see, there's a lot of damage. Uh, she had that provisional done in a different office. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's uh, pretty much a, a big disaster. So uh, we understand why the patient is not happy with her current state. She has a lot of edential areas, a lot of teeth with structural and periodontal problems, but some teeth that look very, uh, very good. So we have to go through our radiographic analysis and we're gonna do a zoom uh, on those 
anterior uh, maxillary teeth, which are the most uh, interesting for discussion and uh, for us to go through the different options available for our patient here. So this is kind of like a summary of different pictures to give you an idea. And I'm going to give you a couple of seconds for you to ask yourself the question of what would I do with this patient if she comes in through my office on Monday? Would I keep those teeth? Would I remove those teeth? Or what additional information do I need to make a smart and objective decision? So we came up with two plans. Plan A would be crown lengthening, endo, foundation restoration, provisionals, implant placement on the edentials areas and the finitive restoration. That means keeping the teeth. Plan B is extracting. And I'm mostly, I'm only going to be talking about the maxillary uh, treatment for the purposes of this webinar. And I'll show you what we did on the mandible, but mandible is easy. The difficult part to make the decision is in the upper. So again, only for the upper. Then plan B would be extractions, bone reduction, implant placement, again, provisionals, and definitive restoration. So again, would you go for plan A in your office or would you go for plan B in your office? And both options are good options. If you decide to go for plan B, I'm not saying you're doing something wrong for the patient. Or if you go for plan A, both are, are correct. It's just a matter of your treatment philosophy. What do you have available in your office? And most importantly, what does the patient want? So what we do here in our office is we sit down with them and we go through the different options and we show them what we're discussing today. You have seven teeth in the, uh, in the maxillary arch. We had more teeth, but uh, as you saw, some of them are like completely uh, hopeless. So these are the teeth that potentially can be saved. And we have the aesthetic risk in which the patient is showing uh, that area as we showed with the lip. So we can go for different options. We can go for a tooth and implant reconstruction. That's a combination. We can go for a fixed hybrid. That means acrylic, like denture teeth and a titanium framework. Or we can go with what we call the implant supported fixed dental prosthesis, which is a more advanced prosthesis on more implants. So uh, long story short, we go through this process um, talking to the patient and we decide to keep those teeth. So we decided to go for plan A and try to maintain those teeth. So the first thing we do is we go through this diagnostic wax up. This is a, an older case we're doing with, with wax, traditional wax up techniques uh, those days. Nowadays, we're using digital technology and digital wax up or digital setups in order for us to save time and be more predictable with the treatment. And we're gonna be talking a little bit uh, about technology and what we use uh, from a digital standpoint in our office uh, at the last case today. So we go through the uh, wax up and we always do this aesthetic uh, prototype or a mock-up in which we uh, use a material to translate what we had from the wax up to the patient's mouth. And we have to analyze and see if what we're, uh, we thought was gonna look good, if it actually looks good in the patient's mouth. So as soon as we put it in, we can see that now we have better proportion of those anterior teeth. We have more tooth exposure and the patient looks very, very good. She's very happy. Um, going back to that lip asymmetry, she had a, a neurological problem in which half of her face was uh, completely frozen and she was in rehab and now she's doing much better, but we can still see a little bit of uh, problems with that, that lip. So there's not much that we can do there, but we want to make sure that from a dental standpoint, we can give her something that's going to be harmonic in her face. So as you remember from the, from the plan, a first step would be was to do a crown lengthening. So we do a traditional crown lengthening. We open up a flap, we remove uh, both uh, soft tissue and hard tissue, always using our guide. Remember that we had that uh, prototype. So we use that as a guide. And now we have much more tooth structure. And again, we go through the uh, root to crown ratio. We analyze all those uh, concepts that we discussed before. And we, once we have that, we're going to send this to our endodontist to go through root canal and those uh, anterior teeth. We do post and core. 
And now that everything is healed, we're ready for implant placement. So we decide to uh, place three implants on the upper right and two implants on the upper left. We do guided surgery. Um, for that case, uh, we're going to be showing both guided surgery and, uh, I mean, computer guided surgery and analog uh, guided surgery. Uh, so you can see a different option. So as you can see from this provisional, things now start to look much better for her. From a dental gingival and dental facial uh, point of view, she's much more happy than she was before. And even though this treatment is going to take some time, as long as we have our patients with good provisionals, they're going to be happy. So once we're ready to take the impression, uh, everything looks good. But as you can see, we had two implants on that left side and we lost one of those implants. So when we did the uncovery, that implant was moving and we had to remove it. And uh, we decide to show this slide because as you, uh, you have experienced before, we do have failures, right? This is no, uh, the idea of this webinar and the idea of uh, spirit education is not just to show ni nice cases, is to really share our experience that we do have implant failures and we're gonna show you how we dealt with that problem. So the patient was in, pro in provisionals for, for around a year now uh, at this point. So we decided why not just go through with the final restorations for all the teeth and implants that are ready. And we're gonna leave that portion of the implant that uh, failed with a provisional. So as you can see, these are the final ceramic uh, restorations. And as you can see here in this area, those two are provisionals. So everything is ready to go, but we just now treat it as a single implant case in which we go back, replace that implant, do a bone graft. And once it's ready, we just finalize the case with final ceramics. So this is a very interesting case in which we could have done plan A or plan B. And I think we would have been able to, this, to defend both options, but I guess it would have been very, very difficult. I don't want to say impossible, but very difficult to get this very nice papilla in between uh, those teeth if we would have gone for a full arch and implants. And I'm, we're going to be showing full arch and implants, but it's very difficult to maintain that papilla when you lose uh, teeth. So these are final radiographs. And um, as you can see, final reconstruction, aesthetically, both from a uh, smile point of view and from a dental facial point of view. The patient looks very happy. Everything integrates nicely. And uh, again, just a reminder, a reminder of where we were and where we finished the case. We gained better proportions of the teeth and we have good stability from a functional standpoint. This has been in the mouth for a little bit over four years. We took pictures when this was four year follow-up and everything is holding up nicely. You can see here from these occlusal shots uh, in the mandible, we did a couple of implants and some um, adhesive restorations and everything is holding up very, very nicely. So that's our first case of uh, today. And um, we like to use that case to show our thought process in whether we wanna keep or extract teeth. And I think we're happy with the decision. I don't know if we will regret making that decision in five years or in 10 years when we start having problems with those teeth. But again, we can always go back and place implants, right? Uh, in our opinion, if we can save teeth, we'll always go for saving teeth. Now let's go to this uh, new case. This is Sandra. She came to our office, of course, with an aesthetic concern of, I don't have teeth in the front and I'm not comfortable with my bite. Of course, there was a full, uh, it was a collapse on the vertical dimension and the posterior segments were completely collapsed. So it was uh, interesting because when you analyze um, the four remaining teeth on the anterior maxilla are pretty much perfect. Those are virgin teeth, don't have a lot of wear, have amazing periodontal support, don't have root canal, don't have decay. So, we start analyzing and we had two teeth in this area, a molar and a premolar that were completely hopeless. And I'm not saying uh, we should save all teeth. We have to be very careful in making the decision. But so again, we look back our distribution, what are the dental gingival aesthetics and what's the number of remaining teeth. So as you can see, we have four remaining teeth after extracting the ones that are hopeless. That's a distribution and she has a high aesthetic risk because as you can see, when she smiles, she's showing all 
the interface between the um, pink and the white. So again, distribution, posterior, anterior, symmetry, all the concepts that um, we explained during the introduction. And what do we do? We wax up. Again, this is an old case. We, we're using wax. And we're going to do a flipper for this patient because she's already dental. So different from the case that I showed before where we did a mock-up or an aesthetic prototype that's going to be over the teeth. These we're going to use a removal because that way we can pretty much analyze the way it's going to look, but the patient can also take this home and she can use this as a um, temporary provisional, uh, temporary removal restoration. So from an aesthetic point of view, this looks great. The patient is very happy with removal. And that tells us that this could be a very good option as a treatment plan. So what options do we have? Of course, we can always remove those anterior teeth and we can go for, let's say, a hybrid. But remember that we're going to need 16 to 18 millimeters in vertical distance if we're using a, a hybrid. And that means that we have to remove a lot of bone, healthy bone from that patient, right? If you want to remove all that anterior maxilla in order for us to hide that transition line, that means there's a lot of bone that needs to be removed. So we decided not to extract those teeth and go for the keeping the anterior teeth that were remaining. So we, we decided to place two anterior teeth on uh, implants on the centrals and having two implants on both posterior sides so we can have a uh, FPD on those implants. So again, we use guided computer-guided surgery and we go through the process. We do sinus uh, grafting in that area. We place the implant completely guided through our surgical guide. And fast forward, everything integrates properly. We start working with our provisional. So now we go from a removable provisional to a fixed uh, provisional on implants, screw retained. If you remember the lower arch had, uh, we had space problems, both from anterior posterior and from vertical. So we decided to do ortho treatment for this patient in order for us to gain more vertical space, but also to align those anterior teeth. And once everything is ready, we move for our uh, final restorations, which are gonna be screw retained zirconia layered uh, crowns with a um, metallic connection. And this is the way everything looks once we finish the case. So step-by-step step of where we started from an occlusal standpoint, where we did the surgery, how uh, the implants were healing and we did that soft tissue grooming around those temporaries and the final screw retained restorations. So as you can see where we started, where we are, and again, it will be very, very difficult to maintain that very nice gingival architecture on those anterior teeth if we would have chosen to remove the anterior remaining teeth. Again, if you decide to make that uh, treatment in your office and the patient understands the biologic cost, the pros and cons of that, it's absolutely fine. We're just showing different options. So we can have you go through this clinical and critical thinking for those cases. Now let's move on to uh, full arch cases. Now uh, we had the opportunity to write this article uh, in 2017 where we went through uh, what we call the LTR classification. Again, there's a lot of information uh, mostly from uh, Ricardo Mitrani and Darren Dister on Spear, Spear platform uh, talking about this. There's a bunch of uh, study club modules, uh, online lessons, digest articles, but this is the original article that was published in the International Journal of Peri and Restorative Dentistry, where we go through, and um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to go through in, in detail, but I just want to give you a snapshot of the four classes that we use for the LTR. Class one, it's a no defect class. Class two is a vertical defect in which we're going to have to compensate with some type of pink material. Class three, we have a horizontal defect. And class four, we're going to have a combined defect. So let me illustrate this with, an, with, a, with a case. Now, uh, this is Clint. He came to see us with a lot of dental problems, but mostly uh, dental phobia. And I'm sure you've, ha you've had patients in which as soon as they come into the clinic, you know, they start shaking and sweating and 
they get very, very nervous just for stepping into a Dell office. So this was one of those cases. So as you can see, we have a lot of periodontal damage. From the clinical picture, it doesn't look that bad, but from the radiographic images, you can see that we had 70, 80% of uh, bone loss around those teeth. Uh, so we had a lot of infection, a lot of inflammation, and a very, very difficult patient to treat. So we decided with him to go through extractions, immediate dentures, sta stabilize all the biological part of, of uh, the, our patient's mouth, and then go through implant therapy. Now, we could have decided to remove immediate implant placement, immediate loading, and all of that. We, we would do quite a bit of those cases. But specifically for this case, we decided to go very conventional. And that's why we like to show this case as well. Because it doesn't mean that if you don't feel comfortable doing full arch with everything immediate, you should not be doing it in your office. It's actually a great, great option uh, for cases. And you can always do it from a uh, conventional point of view. I, I really recommend you to join uh, Ricardo and Darren have an amazing two-day seminar that's online. So you can watch it uh, wherever you are. It's a virtual seminar on treating the terminal lentition, and they go through all of these full arch cases on implants, and they, they have two days to go over it, so they really explain everything in detail. Uh, it's in October, so you can, you can uh, join them if you like uh, this topic and would like to learn more about it. So what we did with Clint is uh, we removed all the remaining teeth, we put him on immediate dentures, we let everything heal for three to four months, and once everything is healed, now we have that white canvas that we can work with uh, designing our plan. So we go through all these pictures and we decide together with him that we are going to be placing four implants in the maxilla and four implants in the mandible since he was a low aesthetic risk. And I'm gonna explain that from this picture. As you can see, when the patient is smiling, the patient is not showing that pink to white transition line. So that means he's a low aesthetic risk. So once we uh, have that decided, we decide to go for four implants and we go through the implant 3D planning. We use the dentures as um, guidelines of where the teeth are and we choose the best sites to place those implants, both for the maxilla and for the mandible. Now, as you remember, we had complete dentures with him. So what we do is we just duplicate those dentures in clear acrylic, very easy, very cheap. You can do it in your office. You don't need a lab, very, very easy to do. And we go through um, the surgical planning in which we're gonna be using a duplicate of the patient's denture. And we're gonna open up that big space in the middle so we can have access to those implants. And we're gonna be using a pro arch guide that's gonna help us with the angulation. So let me go over step-by-step -step of the surgery. First of all, we will reflect a flap and we're gonna try in our surgical guide, which is a duplicate of the denture, make sure everything sits down properly, it's very stable. And we're gonna remove a little bit of bone because as I said, we need around 16 millimeters for these types of restorations. So we wanna make sure we have a flat part of bone and that we have enough vertical space. We place those implants using our ProArch surgical guide to make sure that we have the correct angulation. Here are some different occlusal views of the surgery. And then we connect the SRA or the multi-unit abutment. We connect the titanium cylinders, make sure that everything is in line with our plan. Same, same process for the mandible. And once we have everything ready, we're going to go through what's called the pickup process or the conversion prosthesis in which we're going to convert the removable denture to an implant supported denture that's not gonna be removable anymore. And this is the final, um, final view of the patient after surgery. Everything is done in the same day. So we place those implants and we convert the dentures uh, for them to be immediately, uh, sorry, implant supported. And everything is looking very well. We wait three months after everything integrates properly. And once we're ready, we're gonna go through an aesthetic prototype and go through all the way to the definitive restoration. So these are the final restorations. And as, as I said before, we're, if you have a good technician, we're able to recreate or to mimic very nicely um, 
nature. And as you can see here, we have those, remember we talked about the papillae. So we have those artificial papillae that looks very nice. And when the patient is smiling, you can barely see that pink area. So the patient from an aesthetic point of view, very happy. We're able to provide him with a very stable um, restoration that's not going to be moving around. That's going to be, uh, if the patient is very um, committed to our protocol, uh, coming in for recall, making sure we clean that properly, this is uh, going to last for many, many years. So again, step-by-step step in what we call the delayed implant placement with immediate implant loading. And that's a specific um, recipe that we did for this patient. And again, we made a decision to remove those teeth because of the extent of the periodontal problem. It would have been very, very difficult to try to maintain those teeth. Now let's go for our final case. So we have a couple of minutes at the end to go through some of the questions. Remember, if you have any questions, just uh, go through the Q&A uh, button at the uh, bottom of your toolbar and you can start asking questions so we can go over them at the end of the lecture. Now, again, as I said, why go digital, right? This is a question that we ask ourselves uh, almost every day. If we should be doing uh, more cases digital or we're not there yet. So in our mind, in order for us to make sense of going digital, it has to be more predictable and more efficient. So again, more predictable and more efficient. So we wrote this article in uh, 2016, in which is, was, was one of the first articles that we went for a, a CBCT diagnostic tool for an immediate denture on the maxilla and uh, implants on the mandible. So nowadays this is a little bit more common, but we've been doing this for many, many years and we've been learning a lot. And we've been making a lot of mistakes and a lot of errors along the way because technology has evolved a lot. And as I said, we've been doing this for many years and we have a lot of cases in which we've tried different types of guides. And uh, we're going to show you this case and which is a nice case to also integrate all the digital concepts with our algorithm. So a patient comes to see us. Again, we're gonna be focused mostly on the maxilla for this case. We did some treatment in the mandible, but uh, the patient financially uh, was not ready to treat both arches at the same time. So we decided to go with the maxillary arch first, which was the most uh, critical one. And slowly we're working on her mandible as well. So as you can see here from these radiographs, we have that tooth that's completely out of bone. It's only connected with a, with a bridge. And we have root canal, uh, problems. We have a lot of periapical problems, uh, a lot of uh, loss of tooth structure, and we have some issues with those teeth. But let's go over our algorithm. So we have six remaining teeth. The distribution is mostly anterior. And when we look at the aesthetic risk, we see that we don't have the patient going in very high with the lips. So then that means we have a low aesthetic risk. And when we go through the classification, again, we do the video. You can use a camera or an iPhone to go through that aesthetic assessment. And as you can see from her facial shots and from the video, she's not showing uh, that interface. Now, we decided to remove those remaining teeth based on the assessment. And I don't have time to go over one by one, but we had a lot of period problems. We had endo problems. All those teeth were crowned. And when we remove those crowns, uh, there was a lot of preparation, right? It, it's not the same as preparing a crown 30 years ago for a PFM in which uh, there was a lot of destruction of the tooth. Nowadays, we're more and more conservative. We're removing tooth structure. So going through the analysis, both the whole team here and the patient, we decided it was best to remove the remaining teeth and go for an implant-supported solution. So again, we plan for four implants. And I don't want to give impression that we always do four implants. Sometimes we do four, we do five, we do six, eight, or even 10 implants. And it will depend on case by case analysis. So uh, here, as you can see, uh, sorry, in this slide, we have, we're working with, a, uh, with a, what's called the smile in a box concept. It's a concept uh, from Strauman that you go through all the virtual planning with their team. 
and they send you all these printed guides and a final provisional. So remember in, in the last case, I showed how to convert a denture to an implant supported provisional. This becomes much more easier in which we don't have to go through that denture process anymore. And we're gonna have a milled provisional that we're gonna be picking up with those implants. So let me show you step-by-step -step of the surgical plan. So first step you need to do is you need to use that first guide that's gonna go over the teeth in order for you to stabilize those anterior pins. So this is gonna be a pin supported CAD CAM generated surgical guide. That means that since we're gonna be removing all the teeth, we don't have any area that we can stabilize our guide. So we're gonna be using those anterior pins. So once those holes are made, then you can remove that first guide and you can uh, make all the extractions of the remaining teeth. After that, uh, you're gonna do the bone reduction. And this is very, very nice. Uh, I, I showed in the case before how we did the bone reduction from an analog standpoint, but here you can see that all the excess of bone that's over that surgical guide needs to be removed. So we removed again, the minimal necessary. We don't like to remove a lot of bone because we understand that there's a biologic cost for that. Once we're ready with that bone reduction, we're gonna go over the implant placement guide and we go through the process of drilling with the special kit for those implants. And we place the implants. And once we have the implant placed, again, that milled provisional is gonna sit on top of that first guide that we used. And we're gonna see that here we have the space made for us to inject composite or a pickup material. And that's going to help us connect the temporary cylinders to the provisional restoration. So you can see this is the final position of the implants where we're picking them up. And then we go to the laboratory and in our laboratory, we're just gonna fill the area with composite, polish everything up nicely. And that becomes a much easier process doing it this way compared to the analog way that we showed before. These are some facial pictures and internal pictures of our patient Lulu with the provisional restoration on implants. Now everything was stable. She was very happy with it. We wait for three months for all the implants to integrate properly. And once the three months pass, we're going to remove, make sure that everything looks nice. We take a final impression. And even though we're using digital, as you can see, we still like to take a final impression for our full arch on implants. And we're gonna go through this prototype provisional prosthesis. So even though we were very happy with the aesthetic result from our initial provisional, if you will, we still wanted to make some modifications. We wanted to shift the midline a little bit and we wanted to make some modifications. So we asked our lab to mill a new provisional prototype with those changes. And we're gonna test it in the patient's mouth. And now we're much more happy with it, and once we get the approval from the patient, we ask our lab to fabricate our definitive prosthesis, which is gonna be a zirconia framework with very, very minimal layering on the anterior teeth. And as I said before, we like to use everything screw retained whenever it's possible. And this is the pictures of the final restoration, which looks very nice from an aesthetic standpoint. And also from a bi biological standpoint, looks everything looks very healthy. Um, as I said, we're still working slowly on the mandibular arch, which needs treatment. And um, the patient had some financial problem. That's why we didn't do it at the same time. So to wrap things up, I just want to uh, leave you with this concept of, again, the assessment of the remaining teeth, both from a quantitative and qualitative uh, point of view, the number, the condition, the distribution, and the strategic value. So with that, I want to finish um, the lecture today on time so we can have a, a couple of minutes for Q&A. &A. And I want to say thank you to everyone for joining. I know you have a lot of things to do on a Friday afternoon and for you to decide to spend your time with me uh, one hour. It's really, really an honor and it's been a privilege to be able to share this time with you. So thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for everyone in Spirit Education for uh, this invitation and for you to join. And again, here's my contact information if you want to ask any questions. 
And I just want to leave you with this um, information about Spear. I know some of you know Spear, but uh, Spear Education is, uh, as I said, the premier uh, educational institute. And they have these amazing workshops in which you will be three days with the Russian faculty for Spear. And you're going to be doing both lecture and clinical, I mean, uh, laboratory uh, workshops in which you're going to be showing how to do temporaries on implants, how to design full arch on implants, how to prep teeth, like all these clinical questions that we ask ourselves, uh, um, you can find them here. And also, as I said, Spear Online, which is all these um, very robust uh, online education platform in which you can see like over 1,000 or 1,500 video lessons of all the amazing clinicians showing you um, a lot of um, the critical and the important things that we have to go through in a daily practice. So I hope that was uh, helpful for you and that um, you learned something and that we're able to um, share some information uh, with you today. So uh, I'm going to go over the Q&A. If you have any questions, please uh, make sure to type them in the Q&A uh, section so we can go over them uh, with you here live. Um, okay, so we have a question here from Juan Lu that says, do you prefer to do immediate implant or delayed implantation? Juan, this is a great, great question and it's not an easy answer for that. And uh, we always say that to every good question, the best answer is depends. So I like to do both. And here in our office, we like to do both. Uh, it will depend on many, many factors. Both work great. Uh, nowadays, immediate implant placement works much better than what it used to uh, 20 years ago. We have the geometry of our implants, the surface of the implants, the components, all the experience that we have with immediate implant placement is much better than before. So now we feel, we feel much more comfortable doing it and we do it uh, almost every day and works great. But again, it will depend on case by case. And if you're thinking about full arch, again, I recommend that uh, seminar, um, online uh, seminar that Ricardo and Darren are gonna be doing in October because they really dive into all the different aspects of when to do it and when not to do it. So I hope that briefly answers uh, your question. And uh, okay, yeah, uh, you can see it in the, in the chat. I think um, Kyler already posted the, the dates there the 21st of October. Now let's go for another question. Uh, patients with part functional habits like bruxism, we will go with extractions and implant options. Uh, definitely, uh, this is from Fatwa, uh, definitely uh, we always take very, very good care of the patient's occlusion. We do a very thorough analysis of any part functional activity like bruxism. And having implants on patients with bruxism is not a contraindication. You just have to be a little bit more careful in your occlusal scheme, occlusal adjustment, the material selection, and to be 100% sure that you communicate that to the patient before starting so that they understand that things might break or things will break. And it's not going to be put on you as a dentist or your fault is a patient's parafunctional activity. All of our cases that we finish with patients, we always use a night guard and I recommend you to do that as well. We've had very good success with night guards. Of course, things might break and some patients decide not to use it, but at least we try our best effort to educate the patient and to explain why we should be using a night guard. And from a standpoint of education, again, from a spear education platform, you can, uh, if you're a spear uh, doctor already, look at the patient education videos. And if you're not, I suggest you to really consider uh, looking at that section. We use that section every day with all of our patients. And they have these amazing like one to two minute videos, educational videos for patients in which they have, I think like over 200 videos nowadays. So every clinical condition or any treatment that you might think of, it's already in there. So you just click on play and the patient will understand what's the condition on that they have and also how to treat that condition. So uh, Fadwa, I think I hope that answered your question and that leaves me um, just right on time, uh, Kyler, for you to do the closing remarks and to thank everyone once again for joining. And we hope to see you soon in one of our live events or another online webinar.
Take care. Thank you very much.